Good morning or good afternoon everyone, depending on where you are joining us from, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Rachel Starbuck from the Business Review and I will be your host. It is our pleasure to have LCS Lohman Therapy Systems with us today who will be discussing Oral Thin Films, New Opportunities for Oral Drug Delivery. Today's guest speakers are Rick Chan, PhD, who is Vice President of Research and Development, and Dr. Irish Schnitzler, who is responsible for marketing and sales intelligence. I'd like to welcome you to our new webinar platform. You'll notice that this webinar is browser-based, so if you disconnect, please click on the link that you received via email to rejoin. You may move and resize the windows on your screen to customize your view. All of the icons along the bottom of your screen are the interactive widgets that we have on offer today, so please interact with them all throughout the session. We also have a survey for you at the end of the webinar. In order to ask questions, you can send them in via the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen, or please use the top left hand box. We would allocate around 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the session to address any questions or thoughts that you may have. Please use the help widget if you experience any technical difficulties or require any more assistance. So without further ado, please allow me to welcome Iris. Thank you, Rachel. Hello, everyone. Let's start today's webinar with a short introduction of our company. LTS yes, was founded in 1984. Since then, LDS has gained extensive experience in two main te technology platforms, the transdermal systems and the oral thin film. Here we provide contract development and contract manufacturing services. LTS owns more than 300 patent families, resulting in about 3,000 3, individual patents. Currently, we are very active with 30 cooperation projects. For those of you less familiar with LTS, we operate two sites. Our headquarter is located in Andernach, Germany, and our U.S. facility in West Caldwell, New Jersey. We have a total staff of around 1,200 people, and last year we generated sales of 311 million euros. Oral Simpsons are one of our technology platforms. LDS has gained practical experience with a fairly large variety of active substances treating several indications including allergy, breakthrough cancer pain, cough and cold, migraine, smoking cessation, and vomiting nausea. We perceive ourselves as a full service partner for the pharmaceutical industry. We offer all services from feasibility studies to the manufacture of global supplies. Please allow me to introduce my colleague, Rick Chan. He will proceed with the scientific part of this presentation. Thank you, Iris. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for some of those uh, who stay up late in the evening at, uh, in the Asia-Pacific region. Really appreciate your participation. Um, uh, Later on, I'm going to talk about the transmucosa drug delivery, uh, giving you a bit of overview about the, um, the nature of the, of the technology, and then the oral thin film itself, and then Iris will come back to talk about the market and product, and I will finish off by giving you some uh, uh, case studies on the absorption kinetics and some of the challenges um, that uh, we face in oral thin films. Uh, before I do that, uh, I'd like to pass on to Rachel just to have a sense of, uh, you know, what is your knowledge about the transmucosal delivery. So over to you, Rachel. Thank you very much. So for your first poll question, do you or does your company have any experience in transmucosal drug delivery? And if yes, which kind of products do you have? So your answers are from A, yes, transmucosal sprays. B, yes, transmucosal lozenges. C, yes, transmucosal films. D, yes, others. Or E, no, but sublingual tablets. Or F, no. So what are you expecting from this question, Rick? Uh, I'm just looking at 
the, um, the general knowledge about people in this area so I can actually help modulate in terms of uh, the explanation of some of the technology behind it. Um, so, you know, it would be interesting to see how, how, what people's experiences are. Okay, thank you very much. So it looks like, yes, Transmucosol Films has got 45.6%. So are these interesting results for you? Well, I'm actually very surprised. Uh, so, so I'm talking to a very experienced audience. So, so that's good. And uh, so let's move on uh, with that. Um, so uh, let's go to the next slide and uh, we're talking about just giving you a, an overview about the oral cavity itself. Uh, really, um, the three key areas, one is what's called a masticatory mucosa, uh, extensively keratinized epithelium, which has about 25% of the surface area of the oral cavity. Um, typically, these are the gingiva and the heart palate. Then the lining mucosa is the one that is really of most interest to, to in terms of a transmucosal delivery. This is the buccal cheek itself, the sublingual tissues, uh, mainly on the non characterized epithelium uh, and, and it has the largest surface area. And then thirdly is their specialized mucosa, and these are, you know, like the, the tongue, which contains both uh, types of epithelium. Um, so if you look at this, the, the picture on the left-hand side, and you might not see it very clearly, but it just gives you a sense of, with the characterize, how tightly packed the, um, the epitheliums, epithelia tissues are as compared to that of the non characterized that appears at the bottom of the, of the page. Uh, Mike Repka, uh, or rather Professor Repka, has done a very good job in illustrating this. So, um, in terms of the transport of drugs across the transmucosal membrane, uh, the two major routes, the first one is um, the transcellular, where the, the drugs actually move across the, the cell membrane and then, and then move across uh, to the other side, to the basolateral side. Uh, typically, it's espoused that this is more for the lipophilic molecules. And then there is also the paracellular transporting uh, route where it's in between the, the junctions uh, and is the hydrophilic molecules. Uh, and typically in the normal situation, all these tight junctions are very, very tight and, and that's, that's one of the nature of the buccal cavity and that prevents materials to getting into. So when you deal with transmucosal delivery, uh, one of the, the opportunity is how do you actually open the tight junctions. So some of the, the key factors affecting the, the um, transmucosal absorption is obviously the ionization of the drug. Uh, I talk about the lipophilic molecule in the, trans, in the transcellular. Uh, so the lipophilicity, both kind of making it in terms of the non for the non-ionized species to move across, and that certainly would help. Um, the size of the molecules, we know that um, it, it also uh, works very well. Uh, small molecules like nicotine move across the buccal membrane very, very easily. Uh, salivary flow and the volume and the pH of the oral cavity has a major influence. Um, this is not surprising because if you have if you have any stimulant in the oral cavity, basically you stimulate the salivary flow, and your oral cavity can only hold so much volume of fluid, and anything will be drained into, into the gastric uh, intestinal system. Uh, in most instances uh, where the drug have no issue with regard to hepatic first pass, that obviously is not an issue, but if you do have a drug that, that gets absorbed in, and experience first pass effect that is very detrimental um, to, to that. As, um, to that. Um, the residence time really talks about how much time the, the drug is allowed to stay in the buccal cavity to move across. And the site of administration, obviously, the gingiva and the palate are more difficult for the drug to move across uh, because of the characterized nature of the epithelium. So, so all those uh, factor into how you design um, your 
transmucosal system and also how where you apply it. So moving on, the, the, the next one is really the advantages of the buckle delivery. Uh, I talked about it earlier on, a key component is really it avoids the hepatic first pass effect and therefore uh, it does allow the um, potentially fast onset of action being possible and also an increased bar availability. With drugs that actually the absorption is affected by food and in the stomach uh, and obviously the transmucosal route does not have that issue and potentially reduces the plasma level uh, variability and this is um, important if you have narrow therapeutic windows uh, uh, for the drug. Uh, delivery of acetate bio drugs that I, I think is um, self-explanatory. Um, you know, drugs that are SLA bar, when you go to the stomach, it will just degrade. So again, it offers an opportunity in, in the context. Uh, application in the drug with um, the short half-life, um, this is a real opportunity, how you modulate the absorption kinetic. Um, so this is uh, certainly offer a big opportunity um, in, the, in the drug absorption. Uh, one of the key things is with this is uh, because this is a very novel dose form and it potentially improve patient's compliance. Um, people find it hard to swallow. Um, that no longer presents an issue uh, for them. And this is particularly important if you have post-operative conditions uh, where nausea prevails and also swallowing uh, in the, you know, for the uh, um, geriatric uh, population. Uh, so this this uh, would certainly help improve the patient's intake um, of the drug. So just uh, change the scene a little bit and just giving you um, a quick overview about the oral thin films. Uh, what it is is obviously is, a, is an edible dose form and is a very adaptable design and um, and I'll go into that a little bit uh, in detail later on. Um, it's really very much uh, comprises of both hydrophilic and lipophilic polymers. Uh, and typically you would have a mixture of those um, to, to improve both your processability and also in terms of the oral, um, organoleptic characters. Um, typically it contains drug. Uh, it can be an amorphous in solution form or it can be the crystalline the material that uh, we commonly encounter for a lot of, it, a lot of uh, um, insoluble drugs. Um, the production is really an adaptation from transdermal uh, uh, manufacturing and it's doing by high volume coating and then you slit and then subsequently you, you, you punch the, the uh, desired dose forms and pouch it. Accordingly, so I talked about the the oral thin film. So we it typically has the film formers. Um, typically, I said is a is a blend, and it can be a single or a multi layer design. And they are very functional specific um, layers. A lot depends on how you promote or retard the absorption kinetics. So the different types of polymer will be chosen as a consequence. Uh, in some instances where you know, you might have incompatibility of drugs uh, with some of your excipients. The multi-layer design also offer the protection as it appears. Um, plasticizer and the filler, and this is primarily help to make up the bulk of the all thin film, no different from the lactose in a tablet. And the plasticizer is just to aid the processability and also the subsequent handling. Uh, if you imagine um, some of the polymers, uh, and if you don't have the plasticizers, they becomes very fragile and it becomes very difficult to process. Uh, taste masking agent and flavors that, have, that are very typical, and most of the pharmaceuticals are bitter, so you know the taste masking agents are almost mandatory in, in many instances. Um, pH controlling substances, this is a, a way by which you know, you have your buffering agents to how do you actually maximize your delivery of non-ionized species um, through, the, through the henderson hasselbach equations. Um, so, and then the, finally the colorant, just to make it more appealing, 
and also in terms of the handling from the pouches. And these can be individually packed or packed uh, in a multiple pack, uh, like the Listerine pocket pack for some of you who may be familiar with it, or, or, or some of the breath freshening packs. Okay, uh, the next topic is really just very quickly giving an overview of how all thin films are manufactured. And this is just one way of, of manufacturing and by far um, the most popular way uh, being used. Uh, it's really preparing a coating mass of the blend of, of the polymer and all the ingredients that I kind of talked about. So you end up having a solution or a suspension. And then this is being coated on the process liner. And, and then this goes through a, a huge drying tunnel at variable speed and varying drying conditions um, to actually maximize the removal of uh, water or solvents used to used in, in the in the mixture. And subsequently, the master roll coming out from the drying oven is conditioned, and then it was slit and punched into individual forms. And most instances is packed in the blisters and in, and in uh, aluminium pouches. And by far, uh, the aluminium pouches is really the, the packaging material of choice. So what are the different types of OTF? Just a, a very quick uh, introduction here. Uh, typically, you have uh, what we call fast disintegrating film. Um, this is like the mode of the breath fresheners where you require a burst of the API or the burst of the breath freshening ingredients like the uh, eucalyptus and, and some other stuff, uh, essential oils. Um, and then you have the melt away film that which typically just put it on the tongue and then it dissolves uh, sort of gradually but it's, uh, um, it's still within a reasonable time. And, that, and this is by far the most uh, commonly used uh, uh, way of presentation. And finally is the non-disintegrating buckle film. This is what I call almost like a buckle patch where it adheres to the buckle cavity or in some, or in, in some cases in gingiva. Uh, really, again, depends on the, uh, the application of the API. And, and this is um, basically the, you know, designed to, to stick with the buckle cheek for a period of time, some maybe 30 minutes, uh, some maybe an hour. Uh, a lot depends on applications to deliver really the application uh, required. And this is the point that I'm talking about in how it modulates the, the uh, absorption kinetics. So if we go into a little bit more in detail in terms of the fast disintegrating film, um, typically is the highly soluble, very soluble hydrophilic polymers uh, where you either have the solution or the suspension and typically dissolve within seconds, giving a very good mouthfeel. And, and because of the nature of his rapid solution, uh, you actually potentially get a rapid onset of action via the buckle and the sublingual absorption. Uh, for drugs which does not offer um, the permeability across the transmucosal membrane, of course, will be swallowed. And in that case, then you really offer no additional uh, um, benefit to, to the patient. Um, so then uh, that would become a straightforward um, GI absorption, um, just like a tablet or capsule. The melt-away film uh, is, is, is a single or multi-layer, still very much a soluble polymer. Um, it, it just adheres to, to the cheek or the, or the gingivers. Uh, and dissolves very quickly between you know five minutes, five seconds to about thirty seconds. So this is a, a very quick way of delivering the, the the API. And finally, I talked about the non-disintegrating film. This is typically a multi-layer film um, of uh, structure, a uh, combination of soluble and insoluble polymer. And again, a lot depends on the design. Uh, if you wanted a bilateral 
um, release of a drug, then obviously um, you choose a slightly insoluble polymer, but some people, uh, depending on app application, would go for only a unilateral um, release, and that would typically use as a highly insoluble polymer blend like uh, backing. Uh, so this adheres to, to the buckle cheek, and, and basically the drugs are uh, gradually diffuse across the transmucosal membrane. So if you look at the, the absorption kinetics, and this is obviously a graphical representation, and, and it varies a little bit uh, depending on, on the type of API. Um, you, fast disintegrating buckle film, you typically have a very, very early spike of the peak and then um, it falls off. Uh, motorway, as I said, is more the typical uh, um, profile. Uh, and instead of being your T, your T max being a one to two hours, um, sometimes you offers the opportunity of reducing that uh, um, T max. Uh, the non disintegrating buckle film, as typically, is used as a very much as a control release formulation, and uh, it will depending again depend on the structure. You may be able to to get a rapid onset and then a gradual and then a constant release of the API um, through, the, through the buccal membrane. So that's a quick introduction about the, some of the characteristics of the oral thin film. I now hand over to Iris to talk about the, some of the opportunities from a marketing perspective. Thank you, Rick. Let's have a look at the global RX market. There is a total of nine marketed oral thin film, thin film products. The first prescription product was Consolius, which was launched in 2009. Last year, the OTF generated a total sales of approximately 1.38 billion US dollars. It is noteworthy, however, that the bulk of the sales, namely 99%, was generated by only one product, the Suboxone film. Before discussing individual case studies, let me list the product indications available today. They comprise Alzheimer's disease, breakthrough pain, erectile dysfunction, migraine, opioid dependence, schizophrenia bipolar disorder, sleeping disorders, and vomiting nausea. Our first case study highlights Suboxone film. The Suboxone film is a prescription medicine used for the maintenance treatment of opioid dependence. It contains a combination of buprenorphine and naloxone in a ratio of 4 to 1. Originally, the film was developed as a life cycle management product for the Suboxone tablet. This leads us now to the history of the Suboxone film. The box on sublingual film was launched by Racket Bank Geezer in the U.S. in the second half of 2010. The same year, the patent of the box on tablets expired. By 2012, the sublingual film was able to achieve 55% of the share of the buprenorphine naloxone market in the U.S. In 2012, the box on tablets were discontinued on the U.S. market. Today, the Suboxone film is the most preferred and prescribed dosage form for the administration of buprenorphine naloxone in the U.S. and in Australia. Starting in 2010, sales increased within five years from 69 million U.S. dollars to around 1.4 billion U.S. dollars in 2014. And this is not the end of the story. The launch of the Suboxone film in Europe is expected for 2016. Our second case study deals with the product Onsolis Breckel. Onsolis Breckel is a fentanyl buccal soluble film used for the management of breakthrough pain in opioid tolerant adult patients with cancer. The, object of <coughs> the objective of the product development was to avoid tablet abuse and the fast onset 
of action compared to tablets and patches. Consolis, developed by Biodelivery Sciences International, was the first prescription drug in the form of a film. In 2009, it was launched in the US by MEDA. The launch in Canada took place in 2011. In Europe, under the brand name Breco, also by MEDA in 2012. In 2012, the di distribution of the drug was temporarily suspended in the US. The relaunch is now expected for the end of 2015. Looking at the current sales figures, it is clear that we are talking about the niche product. However, sales went up between 2013 and 2014 by about 500%. Again, it has to be highlighted that we are only talking about European sales in the time period 2013-2014. We expect sales volumes to increase sharply starting in 2016. On the next slide, we would like to indicate the potential of transmucosal dosage forms within a, the fentanyl product. In the chart, the total sales of fentanyl products are shown in dark gray. The sales of fentanyl transdermal patches are illustrated in light gray also showing falling sales figures in the last five years, it should be noted that transdermal patches are still a very important dosage form for fentanyl. The green bar totalizes the sales of the three biggest transmucosal products on the market. Abstral, a fentanyl sublingual tablet, Actic, fentanyl oral transmucosal lozenges, and Subsys a fentanyl sublingual spray. Within the last five years, these three products have gained a market share of 25% of the total fentanyl market. On Zolis, Recul is shown in red. It can be concluded that the advantages of transmucosal products are well accepted, but the potential of the transmucosal films has not yet been fully exploited. And now, Rachel, please proceed with our second poll. Okay, thank you very much. So is there an API within your company's portfolio which you could potentially consider for transmucosal delivery? And your answers are from A, yes, B, no, or C, I don't know. So what are you expecting from this question, Rick? Yeah, I'm just hoping to have a, a gauge in terms of, you know, where uh, everybody's thinking and, and also the opportunity that uh, we may be able to see um, an application for those molecules in a new route of administration as part of life cycle management or in the case of some NCEs, uh, you know, where there is bioavailability issues and people may not be aware of. And that's another opportunity by which we can maximize the, the, the drug exposure. Um, so, you know, reducing the cost of treatment. So, so I just wanted to have a sense of that. Okay, and let's find out. So, yes has got 52%. Are these interesting results for you? Absolutely. And, um, you know, I look forward to, you know, connecting with people with regard to this uh, possible collaboration. Um, so hopefully uh, this uh, webinar will give them a, an opportunity to think a little bit more about their molecules and how do they want to have a desired um, you know, drug profiles and uh, maximize the, the benefit that both the transmucosal route offers and that of the API for effective treatment. So thank you, Rachel. So let me move on to um, case study three. This is just uh, giving you uh, an example about delivering fast onset of action. Uh, I apologize with the, um, the number of uh, um, curves that we have here, but this is all provided uh, in good faith by our sponsors, so it's very difficult for me to tease out some of the others. Uh, on the left-hand side is uh, the CMAX, that unfortunately the, the scale got cut off. So on the, on the, on the, uh, the x-axis is uh, obviously the time cost here. So if you look at the way I pointed out with the innovator tablet, so this is the, the attempt of the, of 
of uh, one of our sponsors to look at how you know uh, mimicking the Innovator tablet as a bioequivalent product. So uh, obviously you can see the Innovator tablet with the T Max around about uh, one and one hours, one and a half hours, and um, the C Max. And if you look at one of the film formulation, which is the one that I pointed, and slightly to the left, uh, a little bit darker green um, to that of the Innovator tablet, it actually achieved the same CMAX. Um, but surprisingly, if you look at the AUC, it kind of looked half that amount of that of the Innovator tablet. Uh, I kind of draw, and I don't know about whether this drug, whether it is the CMAX, uh, the, or rather the concentration, drug concentration, is more important as against the AUC, but I just draw a line at the 400 nanogram per mil, and just to give you a sense, with the Innovator tablet, the duration of action falls roughly just short of four hours. And if you look at the, the, the oral thin film that was tested, it was a shade under two hours. So it's literally half the amount of, uh, half the amount of time that, that is kind of sustained for the therapeutic level. And it's not surprising when we go to the next slide and I tell you that, well, yeah, we have a similar CMAX, but a lower TMAX for the fast acting uh, for the film. And the AUC is roughly 55% that of the innovator's tablet. So what we done was actually achieve the same CMAX um, with half the dose required. What it means is reduce the drug exposure and, and effectively reduce the cost of treatment. And I don't know about the side effect of this particular compound, but potentially, if the side effect is related to either the CMAX or the AUC, you straight away you say, well, it'll reduce the side effect uh, um, impact as well. And, and obviously, if you look at the, sl the, the curves, uh, the uptake, the upslope uh, in the first hour, um, there is a faster absorption um, by the film, of the drug by the film, uh, as against that of the tablet. So, you know, again, if the, if the um, CMAX is, or if the plasma concentration is important, then obviously it's showing that it has a fast onset of action as well. I talked about the, the, the red line and uh, the duration of action is, is kind of like half. So again, um, you know, if this, app this application is very suitable for any episodic treatment. So if you think about if I have a headache, I don't need to have a drug that lingers on for four hours, so on and so forth, and I can have the, the, the tablet or, or rather the thin film I can fix fix up my headache in a very short space of time, and also it wears off the effect in two hours uh, in this particular instance, and therefore I don't need to worry about uh, having a drug um, in, in the system, so to speak. So, so just giving you uh, a snapshot of the of the fast action uh, possibility. Uh, the next one is really looking at uh, um, a very elegant work done by our, one of our sponsors. Um, they were very interested in looking at the kinetics in the, the different oral cavity site. So just to give you a sense, I, I must apologize I didn't explain the, the, the other drug uh, in case study free. Uh, I listed out the, the, some of the physical chemical characteristics of the drug just to give you a sense of the solubility of the drug itself, lipophilicity, and the size of the molecule. So in case study four, um, you see that the one with the blue color, um, or the black, it is actually the, the, that of a tablet. And this is the, the existing product that uh, the sponsor marketed. Um, they look at the oral thin film in two ways. Uh, first of all, applying the, the drug, just putting it on the tongue and allow it to dissolve just like normal. And then the second route is the dark green color, which is an OTF, and they put it under the tongue. Now, um, for those of you who know transmucosal absorption, uh, you know that sublingual route tends to act faster than that of the GI. 
So this is particularly um, curious for all of us, and, and it's kind of like falling outside the rule. Um, so we kind of look at it uh, with the sponsor uh, in a bit more detail. And moving on to the next slide, so this is kind of like the dose that was being administered. So if you look at the tablet of 5 milligram, the old thin film that was placed in the tongue is 5 milligram, and also in that of the sublingual route is also 5 milligram. The one thing that the sponsor kind of picked up is for the sublingual tablet, they actually find a small pulp, and, and I think this is something to do with the clinical design. So there was an undissolved amount of about 3.5 milligram uh, in the pulp that was actually not um, delivered. So if you factor that, is effectively is only a one and a half milligram that was actually delivered. And if you look at the AUC relative of the two OTF applications relative to that of a tablet, um, you can see that the lingual application was actually superior, and the AUC is much, much more at 177%. And if you look at the graph itself, the all thin, the sublingual route only offer about 75% of that of the tablet. However, if you dose adjust it to the 1.5 milligram, the sublingual route was far, far superior in delivering around about 220% uh, to that of the tab reference uh, product itself. So this is a, a great example of, of the different uh, delivering in a different sites uh, and giving you the opportunity to look at how fast and how slow and some of the intricacies of delivering the, the oral thin film um, in real applications. So finally, with case study five, just to give you a sense of some of the formulation challenges, uh, one of the key things with oral thin film is the challenge of recrystallization of the API. Uh, I talk about some of the, the formulations uh, could be a solution form, an amorphous form, and of course, if you have it in the amorphous form, um, you expect it to be faster on set of, of action, but there is a, a downside to that is, you know, it depends on the drug solubility itself, and sometimes it precipitates out. So if you look at the left-hand side of the, of the, of the picture, uh, this is a 4 milligram API uh, deliver, and you see the lumen of the polymers, they are fairly clear, and some of those, uh, one of the, the the yellow orange spot on the left, and that's actually undissolved polymer. Uh, so you see a few of those uh, in on the slide. And and if you when we increase the dose from eight milligram to the loading to to eight milligram, um, you see the lumen starting to kind of congest it, and then that's where the the the, the drug starting to crystallize out. And that obviously is an undesirable effect. Uh, what we have done with um, this particular API was to change the polymer platform. And you see on the right-hand side is instead of using HPMC, we use the methacrylate copolymer. And you see the inset uh, essentially the drugs are all dissolved uh, in, in the in the uh, polymer matrix, and this is uh, this is a very important aspect uh, when we come to the formulation of oral thin films. How do you strike the balance of maintaining the product in solution or in crystal form without recrystallization and also the growth of of crystals from your suspended particles? So, so this is this is a, a great illustration. As I said, the, the the physical chemical characteristics of the drugs are, you can see that this is a highly insoluble compound, very lipophilic, uh, and fairly large molecule as well. So this is a, a great um, example of, of the use of the, of the optimum choice of the polymer in, uh, as a platform uh, for the formulation. 
So I hope in the last um, 40, 45 minutes uh, we've given you um, a quick tour with regard to the oil thin film and the trans transmucosal delivery uh, in terms of demonstrating to you about the, the possibility of improving the bioavailability and then also reducing the dose, um, um, mainly for those drugs which have a hepatic first pass, certainly is a real consideration. Uh, it really is possible to achieve fast onset of action, uh, both real and perceived, and this is particularly important because, as we all know, placebo plays a very important part in any medication. Um, for those who have been in pain management, um, the placebo effect is huge. So the fact that some of the, the, the dose form dissolves rapidly um, can often lead to a more positive outcome to that of a patient. Um, finally, is really that you can modulate the, the PK profile. Uh, so again, you know, there is a lot of opportunities um, um, to move, uh, to formulate an OTF as a real alternative to, to your API. Um, so, to, uh, sorry, to, to your to tablet dose form for your API. So I think there is a, um, a, an opportunity here for life cycle management of your product. Uh, at the same time, for those who, who work on NCEs, and I know people, the first thing that we do are always go to the tablet because this is trial and trusted. We all know about it. But I would ask you to stretch your imagination, understand more about the OTF, and see how you may find this dose form as a way of, of uh, delivering the, the promise that your drug could deliver. And at the same time, this innovative dose form offer you real market differentiation. So um, that's all I have, and um, so I would invite you to have questions, and I think Rachel is going to uh, chair that session. Thank you very much, Rick. So thank you to everyone who has already sent their questions in. I know we have had a lot of questions in. So please continue to send in your questions via the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen, or please use the top left hand box. We will try and get through as many of the questions as possible. However, if we do not have time to answer them all in this webinar, then Iris or Rick will get back to you at a later date. So for your first question, why choose sublingual over transbuchal? Um, the, the, this is very much to do with the structure of the oral cavity. Uh, the sublingual is highly vascularized, so for, and, and also the, the amount of uh, epithelial cells are actually thinner, uh, also thinner than that of the buccal cavity. So if you look at the non-keratinized, you're talking typically about 40, 50 cell layer thick, um, sublinguals varies um, to about half that amount. So, so from a diffusion point of view, there is a, uh, um, an advantage, and that is also one of the reasons why sublingual delivers drugs faster uh, when all things are equal. Thank you very much. And what are the limitations of the drug loading with the films? Good question. Um, typically, uh, we would say this: you would go for about between 30 to 40 percent of the weight of the wafer. Uh, again, bear in mind we need consideration about the solubility and how you design the, the, the dose form. Uh, so, so, so typically, I would say this is about 30 to 40 percent of the weight of the wafer. So, uh, I would go for 25 milligram is a is a very comfortable range for a what I call a typical wafer of, you know, seven square centimeter. But if you increase the size of the of the wafer, you actually increase. You can increase the the, the loading of the, of the drug. Um, so 30 milligram to 40 milligram is a real possibility um, if you if you if you are prepared to compromise some of the other attributes um, like you know the the, the the quick dissolving aspects. So, so there, there are multiple ways to achieve that. Thank you. And is transmucosal delivery a barrier to large molecules such as 
immunoglobulins. Absolutely, because uh, just like skin, um, you know, the buccal cavity and all these, all these are designed to prevent materials going through. Um, so, so what we are what we're doing is is actually trying to find a, a clever way of making the drug molecule to move across. And I talked earlier on about you know the molecular size being important. Uh, certainly, uh, something like nicotine with a very small, with about 200, uh, I think 212 uh, molecular weight, uh, is a much much smaller molecule than any of your peptides. For instance, insulin, which is about 13 to 14,000. Daltons. So, so there is a, there is obviously um, a, a challenge there. Thank you. And is multi-pack packaging accepted for pharma products? Um, I would say so. Uh, I like to I like to understand why people don't think that it is um, not a um, acceptable presentation. Uh, it is no different from you know, having a bottle with uh, 30 or 90 tablets in there. So, so one of the, when I say that, I, I, I put a caveat. You need, to, you need to have accurate dosing and you need to have uh, um, a perforated or serrated uh, or thin film with the multiple pack and to, to cut it off. Thank you. And can you elaborate further on faster onset OTF examples on the market? Um, at the moment, I don't see any of those that are fast acting. Um, I think they're designed for a very specific reason. Um, so, in terms of real pharmacokinetics, uh, I don't see that. I don't. I haven't seen one yet. Put it this way. That doesn't mean that. You shouldn't go for it. A lot depends on, uh, I, think, I think one of the reasons why people have not gone for it is because of the registration process and also because potentially when you put a claim of faster onset, it, you, you now move away from, potentially move away from the bioequivalency uh, of the product and it just presents additional challenges from a registration point of view. But to me, that's uh, more of a marketing strategy than against technology limitation. Thank you very much. And what kind of polymers are used for extended release? Um, typically, it's the insoluble polymers. So you can think about the HPC um, along those lines. And high molecular HPMC as well. Uh, a, a lot depends, again, it depends on the system design. Thank you. And are there any challenges with respect to formulating heat liable labial uh, molecules? Uh, of course, I talked about that uh, uh, most of the com most common uh, processing is, is through is the heat drying. So, yes. Uh, um, that presents a challenge. A lot depends on on how you do it. Uh, let me give an example. So, uh, for those people who are familiar with making tablets, uh, ibuprofen has a sublimation point about 38 degrees C. So, how do you dry the granules coming out from ibuprofen? So, is this similar approach? How do you exercise care uh, and process control to, to actually make sure that your heat labile substances do not degrade. Thank you. And for poor permeability compound, is it possible or promising to use permeation enhancer or bioadhesives to significantly enable the transmucosal delivery? I think that's a great question. Uh, certainly, I, I did not talk of, uh, about it in the in the webinar, but but certainly uh, permeation and hazard plays a key role uh, for some of those poorly permeable products, and and uh, a lot depends also with the types of of transport, and and that's where I talk about the 
the both the transcellular and the paracellular and depends on which route and the lipophilicity of the drug, uh, you need to use different types of permeation enhancers um, to, to maximize the, the, the permeability diffusion. Thank you. And what is the maximum resist resistance time of mucoadhesive buccal film in the mouth? Um, I don't have an answer for that. I, I think uh, a, a lot of this will be very much depend on the on the API itself. Um, let me get a crazy example. For instance, if you were to if you were to um, formulate a capsaicin, API, you know, or thin film, I am pretty sure you won't be tolerated for too long in the buccal cavity because you will start to have edema and erythema very, very quickly. So, so the API plays a very, very key role in terms of how it induces the sensitivity. And secondly, is depends on how you design a system. Uh, is it going to be occlusive or going to be semi-occlusive? And what is the amount of salivary that would be allowed to move across the the surface of the buccal cavity? Uh, because we, don't forget, when you are doing the control release, you have a high concentration of drug uh, at a one spot. So a lot of factors play into that. So so. Um, I don't know what would be the appropriate time um, in terms of inducing that because that is very API dependent. But just just to add on to that point, uh, Rachel, um, Onsalis uh, actually uh, advised people to have the the application time for about 30 minutes. So so you know again with buprenorphine it is. You know, people cannot tolerate it for 30 minutes. So obviously, that is also acceptable to the patients uh, from a patient's point of view. So just bear in mind, your API, your system design, will will, will be a key factor. Thank you. And do you control the temperature and moisture of the room, or do you just record it? Sorry, uh, I missed that, Rachel. Sorry. Can you repeat that? You, yes, of course. Do you control the temperature and moisture of the room, or or do you just record it? Um, the, well, it depends on, on when you when you do the work, when you are doing the laboratory work. Um, yeah, you you record it, and is like the normal practice. Uh, give you the best uh, uh, information. So if ever something didn't quite, you know, the result didn't quite turn out what you expect, at least you can refer, refer back to back to the conditions. Um, sometimes the, in extreme conditions, it does affect the performance of, of the uh, formulated products. So I would just call it as a good scientific uh, approach of how you do that. Thank you. And methacrylate copolymers, if used, do not give fast dissolving films. Does that mean we can't use it for fast dissolving film? Well, not necessarily. I talk about it in terms of whether it is real or perceived. So the, the, the design becomes very important in terms of the nature of application. So, you know, you might have something that um, does not dissolve immediately, but on the other hand, if it breaks up, and I'm using this as an example, if it breaks up, um, the patient may not be aware that it actually n does not dissolve. So, so it, it, it offers a perception that the drug, that the, the, the orthin film is fast acting, but it may not be. Uh, it may be well be orally ingested and absorbed through the GI tract. So it is important in terms of differentiating what your key objectives in terms of formulation is. 
Thank you very much. And sadly, this is going to have to be our last question for today. So what is the maximum size a typical patient should take? Typical size, well, what do you mean? I, uh, I think I, I talked about, like, for instance, uh, a most common size is around about, 100, uh, around about 7 uh, square centimeter. So, so that's kind of a, like a, a typical size, but it can vary, depends on, on the, um, the application, and, and you can increase that. Um, but I would say a 10 square centimeter um, OTF uh, would be would be uh, probably uh, um, the, the maximum size. Uh, but on the other hand, on the lower end, you need to be able to uh, be able to pick it up and pull it out from the pouches. So there are considerations in terms of handling as well. Thank you very much, Rick. So sadly, that is all we have time for in today's session. So if we didn't get around to answering your question, then Rick or Iris will get back to you at a later date. So that just leaves me to thank Rick and Iris for what was a great presentation, and thanks to LTS Lohman Therapy Systems for sponsoring this session. To the attendees, you will receive an email shortly telling you how you can access the on-demand version of this webinar, or you can access this through our website, which is www business-review-webinars.com. We look forward to sharing further webinars with you, so please do keep an eye out on the website just mentioned and follow us on Twitter at BR Webinars for daily updates and join our LinkedIn group, Business Review Webinars. So thank you once again to everyone, and I hope you all have a nice day.